coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Jumbo, jumbo, everybody, and a very warm welcome to a rather windy morning here in the Maasai Mara. My name is David, and this is Wild Wonderland. This is happening, folks. This is 100% live. Here we are. We're watching the migration story unfold. Here's a lion. There's a lion right next to us. Oh, that was close. You can't possibly script something like this. Good morning and welcome to CGTN's Wild Wonderland live show. My name is James Hendry. On camera we have enormous James. There is his gloved hand and it's a huge privilege as always to welcome you to Africa. We are coming to you live from three locations on this magnificent continent up here north in the Masai Mara of Kenya. Just a little bit to the south, the Serengeti of Tanzania and way south of that, the Kruger National Park of South Africa. We are sitting here in amongst the herds of the Great Migration. They have moved quite a long way to the north and to the west from when we first saw them about six days ago. Now please do talk to us during the course of the show and you can do that on Twitter using the hashtag CGTNWild or the hashtag CGTNWildWonderland. So that's on Twitter, hashtag CGTNWild or hashtag WildWonderland. These are the herds of the Great Migration. In amongst them you will see some zebra. You might even be lucky enough to see some Thompson's gazelle. Together they make up two million migrating herbivores. The red oat grass plains of the Mara Serengeti sway in anticipation. In February, around 400,000 wildebeest are born on the short grass of the Serengeti's southern plains. Just half an hour the calves have found their feet. And one of nature's greatest journeys begins. From the southern plains, more than a million animals move northwest into the Serengeti's western corridor, massing on the banks of the Grumeti River. As the rut ends, the herds gallop north once more. Eventually, two million grazers arrive to feast on the abundance of the Masai Mara. It begins with the trickle of the zebra vanguard, enjoying the undisturbed long grass plains, making the first crossings of the turbulent Mara River. Many fall to the rapids and the crocodiles. And then comes the main body of the migration, the thundering herds of white-bearded gnu, bleating songs of chaos in search of green pasture. The herds know the danger but the call for food is too great. All must take the plunge. Not all will make it. For those that do, hungry prides and clans patrol the banks. For survivors, rich red oat grass is the reward. Before it's time to cross the river again, as nature's greatest herd follows the life-giving storms, verdant plains of the Mara Serengeti for nourishment. Good morning and welcome to the Mara Triangle in Kenya where we are with a beautiful herd of elephants and some buffalo all just enjoying the nice morning sunshine and the beautiful green grass underfoot. Hello everybody, my name is Steve Falkenbridge and I'm joined by Jandre on camera and what a marvellous morning we're having out here. The sun is warming our backs and the wind is a very gentle breeze cutting across and well what more can you ask for on a day like this than beautiful herds of elephants out in the open. The Olololo escarpment at the background there, behind us the Mara River and the Serengeti border towards the south with Tanzania forming what we call the triangle, the three barriers forming the triangle with the Masai Mara reserve on the other side. 
We are up in the northern section of the triangle where the migration herds have not yet gotten to. And it's why the elephants are enjoying themselves the peace and quiet that is up here at the moment. And Robin, you are so looking forward to another great drive. Well, we're looking forward to bringing you one. And well, like I said, there's no better photo than herds of elephants moving across the open plains, grazing a non-stop affair with a herd of elephants. They are eating between 18 and 20 hours a day. Can you imagine that? Okay, well, James with the migration herds has managed to spot one of the most attractive birds around. Yeah, this is one of the most beautiful birds I think we find here. It is called a grey crowned crane. And it is, interestingly, although it looks like it's sharing the migration meal with the wildebeest, it isn't. What it's doing is eating the seeds of the grasses, where, of course, the wildebeest are trying to get hold of the rich green leaves underneath where the seeds are. Now, these wonderful birds live in pairs and often around bits of water. So little marshy areas or ponds or river banks, you'll often find a pair of grey crowned cranes. And they're endangered birds. They, you wouldn't think so if you drove around here, but they certainly are endangered. And their family occurs throughout the Palearctic, so all the way through Africa and down through Europe and Asia, you'll find different species of cranes. And often they're very famous. They're often spoken about in folklore. <laughs> Suzanne, I think the smells of the wilderness certainly are some of the most special things for me. They, they conjure up memories at, for me. And while the fact that there are so many uh, wildebeest in the area certainly does give the area a slight smell. It's not a bad smell to my nose. It smells a bit like goat. I think that's the strongest smell I can, or the most obvious smell that I can liken it to. Mixed with a bit of cattle, sort of goaty cattle type smell. But you know, it's such a rich smell of life. And although you wouldn't want to spray it on yourself before you went out on a hot date, you would, it certainly conjures for me a feeling of fertility and life, which is just beautiful. Now, a bird not quite as beautiful as the grey-crowned crane, but not nearly as ugly as the marabou stork, he is one of our five vulture species. Well, very true, James. I think for me, crown cranes are some of the most beautiful birds we got in Africa. And not sure many people will uh, disagree with me when I say vultures are not as good looking, I would say, like the cranes. And this, also, this all happened during the migration. And apparently until maybe two weeks ago, when the wildebeest came in here, most of these, I would say, not ugly birds that you're seeing, were all gone. And they were all in Serengeti National Park in Tanzania following the migration. Now, you can see lots of them in the air there, gliding. And what they do, they take advantage of the thermos, heat thermos, to glide. And ideally, they're just scanning the ground to find out what could be out or down there. And there could be all types of uh, vultures that you see there. We've got about seven different species of vultures, especially here in Kenya. And most of those are either white-backed vultures or the Rupert's griffin vulture. Now, once they spot something from up there, they just fly down and they start, you know, either scavenging on it or stay close. If the, cat, the killers or the cats are there, they'll wait until they move away. Now, I want to show you the one to the right. You see, on that tree there, there's one particular vulture to the right. And this one, is the largest vulture and the strongest vulture that we got in East Africa, and it's called the Nubian vulture. And in general, they go in twos, while the others are always very gregarious. This particular one here, you'll always see a male and a female. It's the Nubian vulture, 
or the Lapet Fest Vulture. Well, there's a lot to offer, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll now take you across all the way to South Africa to my friend Jamie, who is trucking. David is absolutely right. Good morning to you all. My name is Jamie and behind the camera is Craig. And you're watching us take a live bushwalk through the Greater Kruger National Park where we this morning have had a very busy morning. This morning we, I woke up at about four to hear the sound of buffalo being attacked by lions. Unfortunately, it sounds as though they've moved into an area that we cannot follow. But Hosanna, the male leopard, was seen in this area and then the vehicles couldn't keep up with him and they lost him. And this is where being on foot really comes into its own because we can actually move through areas that vehicles cannot and we can see whether or not we can pick up on any footprints, which is exactly what Herbie has done. We walk with a gentleman called Herbie. He's hiding away. <laughs> he's gone into the thicket and he's picked up on tracks somewhere through here. There we go. You can see it now perfectly. That's the leopard track we're looking for. It's very different tracking something like a leopard because sometimes it seems as though they walk over areas where it's it's almost like a piece of tissue blowing over sand they walk so lightly we're going to follow this track while we do we're going to send you across uh, to steve whose animals leave slightly larger footprints good luck jamie you've had a great week on foot with the big animals hopefully you managed to find horsana well, we are here with this herd of elephants, a beautiful family grouping made up of adult females with their offspring. So you will get grannies and mums and daughters and then sons up to the age of 15, 16. And then eventually they get pushed out as they start showing interest, sexual interest in the females. They get pushed away then to live a life of a nomadic male. H.R. Amin, you want to know what else elephants eat apart from grass? Well, in the Mara, they eat an enormous amount of grass because it is so prominent here. But they'll also feed on small herbs and forbs on the ground. And those tusks that you see there are used for gouging into trees where they actually strip the bark of the trees. You can see the left tusk is a little bit more damaged than the right. Elephants are left or right-handed, we call it. And they'll use one tusk more than the other. And they use that for gouging and ripping bark off of trees. And trees have got enormous amount of medicinal value. Uh, they also push over trees with their big foreheads um, and then rip up the roots, feeding on the cambium layer in the roots as well. And they'll also feed on multitudes of fruit as well as leaves of the trees. And it's all very seasonal. And they'll all feed on whatever they feel like as the time goes by. Down in South Africa, we see an enormous... Uh, switch from grass in the summertime to trees and bark specifically in the winter time uh, that's because of the seasonality we have down there whereas up here there is an enormous amount of grass throughout the year uh, the migration herds force the elephants to move out of these plains and then they probably spend a lot more time feeding on trees up in the mountains but they are probably one of the most selective feeders that we find their trunk moving through the grass there they're actually sniffing and trying to particularly find exactly what they want out there okay well it sounds like james has managed to catch up with one of those fast cats let's go and see what it's up to we've managed to catch up with a cheetah and we think it's a female cheetah and we think that it's a female cheetah called kakenya She's quite famous in this area. And I know that the view isn't the best because she's lying in the grass, but she is very close to the migration herds. We haven't gone far from where we were before. And if there is a chance of a cat hunting in the middle of the day, it's most likely going to be a cheetah. There are the herds. So she'll just lie here and hope that something comes a little bit closer during the course of the day. She'll probably hope that it's a youngster. 
Righty, we're going to stay with her, but David's got a predator that's a little bit more active than this. Well, stay right there, James. Don't go anywhere because we were watching uh, those vultures out there, you know, on the top of that tree and just found from a distance this hyena who is feasting. How cool is this? This particular hyena is what we call the spotted hyena. And for those of you who could be joining us now, my name is David and on camera with me is Bungay. It's exciting to see all what comes with the migration here between Kenya and Tanzania. You're watching CGTN World Wonderland Live Show and we're coming to you live from Kenya, Tanzania and South Africa. Here in Kenya, we're in the Masimara and we got a spotted hyena who took advantage, I would guess, of a kill that could have happened here maybe early this morning by some lions. She eats, she poses, she looks, just in case the killer, who I guess is a lion or lion, lioness, may come back. So what she has to do is to eat very quickly. And if you look, he has taken some very good position to feed next to some tall grass, taking some good cover so that she is not spotted. So speed for her is very important. She has to eat as quickly as possible. And I'm sure you know most of them do not even chew. They just cut, cut and swallow. Cut, cut and swallow. So I want to move around in this particular area because I've got a feeling whoever could have killed uh, this, which I guess is a wildebeest, could be around here. But in the meantime, we'll take you across to Tanzania to my friend Tristan, who I think got more wildebeest. Indeed we do, David, and good luck on your search. As you can see, there's still a few herds that are remaining in Tanzania's Serengeti National Park in a beautiful area with lots of rocks and beautiful trees. My name is Tristan, as David mentioned, and I've got David on camera as well this morning. And it says a warm welcome to the Serengeti. As you can see, these herds behind me are busy grazing at the moment, and they're slowly heading their way towards the river at the moment. There is a bigger herd that is ahead of us that is close to the river. It's where we were actually heading, but it was just such a beautiful scene here to be able to stop and just take in the rocks and the trees. It's very unique to this area. It doesn't look anything like the Mara, as you can see. The Mara is more those big open grasslands, but this area, you get these beautiful kind of um, acacia woodlands with these rocks and the wildebeest in amongst them makes for a very pretty scene. And it's beautiful just to stop and listen to the wildebeest and watch as they go meandering their way down towards the river section. Now, this morning we were following a leopard for the better part of about two hours but unfortunately he gave us the slip in a big rocky outcrop so what we have decided is that we're going to head towards the river in the hope that the wildebeest that are heading in that direction are going to start to build up and potentially cross they often do cross around this sort of time of the day from now until about lunchtime so it's a good gamble to take and hopefully we are going to get lucky with them there there will be lots and lots of sure of hungry crocodiles that will be waiting and many other predators that could be in the area as well so it's a worthwhile gamble you can see there's a zebra that is stuck in amongst the rocks as well having a bit of a feed they often do climb up the rocks a little bit just to be able to get to some of the grasses that haven't been eaten at this stage there's still a few grasses that are growing between the rocks that are tasty and not nearly as sort of short and so you often find some of the animals going in between them to feed right we're going to carry on towards the river we're going to see if we can catch up with that herd that's building there in the meantime though let's send you across to steve who's got a slightly larger grazer with him Thanks, Tristan. Well, you are back on the Mara Triangle side. And if you are just joining us, you are watching CGTN Wild Wonderland live show. And we are here with a big grumpy buffalo bull, also known as a dugger boy. And dugger is a local word for the term mud. And you see how well covered in mud he is. Now, these individuals are always the grumpy ones. Lions are constantly trying to catch them. And buffalo with those enormous horns, well, they always fight back. Buffalo. 
a lion pride's ultimate challenge. A hunt for a full and coordinated team of lionesses. First, they single out a victim, panicking the herd and breaking its united front. Taking care to avoid the cow's raking horns, this experienced pride set to exhausting, injuring and eventually flooring their victim. By rights, once she was down, her muzzle being crushed by dagger canines, the outcome was certain. Or was it? Sometimes buffalo find the courage to fight back, rescue their own. The lion slept hungry and humbled that night. Very interesting to me how few times I've seen prey fight back. And I think that if they manage to gather themselves together and fight back against their predators more often, I think that the predators would starve quite quickly. Thompson's gazelles at the back there, they are the last of the migration herds and they're supposed to be around about 200,000 of them or so that come with the migration and they really like the kind of short grass. They are not great fighters back against predators. Their main uh, defensive mechanism is being the fastest antelope in the world. So they will run almost as fast as a cheetah, somewhere around 85 to 90 kilometers an hour. So they're incredibly speedy. They're very small, so they won't try and fight back. I've seen wildebeest once or twice try and fight back. They've chased away lions and sometimes they'll chase cheetah, but they're very easy to panic, you see. So a lot of these animals, when the predators get in amongst them, they panic. And that's in fact a predator strategy to make them panic. And when they panic, they're hopeless at defending themselves. Those horns can do quite a lot of damage, but because they panic so easily, they're pretty easy to catch at night for the lions. Zebra fight back with their nasty kick, but interestingly, a lot of people don't realize that they bite as well. They've got a really vicious bite. So they will use both their kicking and their speed and their biting. But something like a buffalo, for example, is a real challenge for a lion. And if they stood together and faced the lions and didn't ever run away, I don't think they'd ever get killed. But as soon as they turn and run, there's a real problem. Our cheetah is still here. She's still fast asleep in the grass. So we're going to sit with her for probably another five or ten minutes. And then we'll move on and see if we can find another predator. Meanwhile, Steve is with, of course, the buffalo bulls. Thanks, James. You are so right when you talk about buffalo running. If they did stand their ground, lions don't know what to do. Actually, jean and myself saw a lioness the other day run at a wildebeest. It's quite a young wildebeest as well, maybe about two years. And it turned on the lion and showed its horns, and the lion ran away. Lion doesn't know what to do when a, predator, when a, uh, a prey animal turns on it. And these buffalo bull, these lone buffalo bull, maybe in small groups, they generally don't run because they know when they run that they are prime game for the cat. Cats love to chase things that run. But if the buffalo keeps its guard, stands its ground and faces down the lion, there's a very good chance the lions will just leave it alone. But as soon as they run, that instinct in the lion just triggers and off they go and chase it. It's one of the number one rules in the bush, never ever run. No matter what you do, never run. A big buffalo like this could weigh up to eight, nine hundred kilograms, 16, 17, 1800 pounds, everybody. Now you can imagine that is a huge amount of weight. And those horns hooked back like that, the buffalo knows exactly where they are and they're able to lift their head down and catch a lion with those horns and throw them in the air. I've seen a lioness of about 140 kilograms, close to 300 pounds, thrown 10, 15 feet in the air by a little flick of a buffalo's neck. They are incredibly powerful. And when lions do go for them, they always do so in a pride, often with a male in tow for the extra weight to pull them down. And they always go for the back, try and jump on the back, try and break the back legs or the hamstrings to, to immobilize the buffalo. 
all the while keeping away from that very powerful neck and those very sharp and strong horns. A grazer, like many of the animals out here, the buffalo spend most of their time in these areas, especially these old buffalo bulls. They're way too old and lazy to partake in large movements. And so they often will encounter lions and uh, quite often makes them even more grumpy. Moving away from the herds in groups of 15 or so, done with all the politics and pushing and shoving that comes with being inside a buffalo herd, these old buffalo bulls go into a sort of retirement and slowly, one by one, they get picked off by lions, not without dishing out a little bit of punishment themselves. You see he's on his own, so he has to look up quite regularly to see if anything's trying to sneak up on him. There we go, he's coming to give us a little bit of a hard time. Very wet nose. listening and trying all the while to figure out if we're posing a threat. Well, down in South Africa, Lauren's looking for the most regal of cats. Let's hope she finds Hukumuri the leopard. Welcome, welcome everyone to the wild wonderland that is South Africa. My name is Lauren and I do have Seb on camera today. And as was mentioned, we are looking for a very interesting cat. His name is Hukamuri. He is a dominant territorial leopard around here and he's been spotted, literally. And we're just trying to work out exactly which way he's gone. He is a very unusual looking leopard, shall we say. And he recently lost an eye. So he is a one-eyed leopard and we haven't seen him in quite some time. So we are furiously searching the area and listening to see or to hear, sorry, if we can hear him calling. So we're going to keep on searching around. And of course, why is he so unusual? Let's find out. Establishing a territory allows a male leopard access to females and therefore mating rights. The Duke of Juma, Tigana, has defended his domain from a long line of intruders. The latest of which is Hokomori. Tension fills the air at Juma when the interloper comes calling. Nobody knows where he originates. Nobody knows his origins. But what we do know is that he is a lethal threat to Tingana's offspring, Princess Tlalamba and the little chief Hosanna. Hukumori is about six years old, in his prime and looking to expand his territory. His intense gaze is spine-chilling. His courage is a warning to anyone who gets in his way. He is a calculating hunter, boasting strength, stealth and skill. Is it time for Tingana to retire? It would seem his day is not yet done. He has recovered from the illness that allowed Hukumuri to stake a claim. Now, the old Duke's calls echo through the Juma night air once more. Well, we knew that the tracks were fresh and we knew that our leopard was only just a little bit ahead of us. And from the birds calling and the squirrels making an almost witch-like laugh in alarm, which they always do for leopards. We knew that he had to be somewhere around here. And there he is, the little chief himself, one of the only leopards that you can actually spend any kind of time with on foot. And he has gone straight to sleep. He was looking at us a second ago. He had his head up 
and now his head is down again. And this is exactly what being out on foot is all about. It's about relocating the animals, figuring out which way they've gone, and, of course, experiencing special moments just like this, where you can sit and watch a leopard. We'll never get as close as the vehicles can get. They'll never be as relaxed as they are around the vehicles. But at the same time, you'll never experience anything as profoundly as you will when you're on foot with a wild animal. And the fact that he lets us get this close, as I've mentioned before, is something very special about him. He can hear something, and what he can hear is a pair of Franklin that are slowly feeding across in his direction. They are actually just in front of us. I don't know if they've even seen us yet. I hope they don't start to make a funny noise and give him a fright. Annette says, awesome to find Hosanna. And she says, a good job, Jamie. Good job, Herbie, really. He was the one who showed us a true tracking expertise in finding this leopard. So a big thank you to Herbie for this. He's done an excellent, excellent job. It's not easy tracking a leopard. It must be one of the hardest animals to track out here. The only one that I can think of that would be harder to follow one individual is a hyena because there's always so many of them moving about overnight that you never know which way they've gone. But a leopard, you have to look so, so closely at the ground. And there's the added disadvantage that their camouflage hides them so perfectly that you actually have to be incredibly careful where you're walking. We were walking through some thickets earlier, and I was thinking, we're not going to see Hassan until we step on his tail, unless he moves beforehand. It was so thick in there. Fortunately, though, he's actually moved out and into the open. And depending upon Lauren's luck with Hokumuri, what we'll do is we'll spend a little bit more time with him. He's perfectly relaxed. He's sleeping now. We'll spend a little bit more time with him, see what he gets up to, and then <coughs> she can come and take over from us in the vehicle. Quick, let's go over to Tristan. These elephants are about to cross a river. Welcome back to the Mara River. And we apologize about the sound issues coming down from the Serengeti. Here we are at one of the little secret spots along the Mara River that we've traversed through some very thick vegetation to get through some beautiful forest and the murky Mara River flowing past us here. We're trying to see if maybe there were some animals coming down to drink because the water is the currency of life. And the Mara itself is the currency of this ecosystem that we have. And we're going to just have a little scratch around here, see if we can find anything. It sounds like Tristan's managed to sort out his sound issues. Let's go back down to the Serengeti. Indeed, so sometimes the perils of being out in the African bush and being alive. But anyway, like I was saying just now before we had a few issues is that it's a crossing that we weren't quite expecting. We were hoping for a crossing, but we were hoping for zebra and wildebeest. Instead, we've got a beautiful big elephant herd that is busy moving across the Mara River. And you'll notice that the Mara River in this particular area looks very different to that of the Maasai Mara. The Maasai Mara's river is much tighter, steeper banks, and not nearly as many big boulders in the water as what you see here. The river really widens quite a lot as it comes into the Serengeti and it is an epic place to watch animals. You get these amazing palm trees and then obviously when you've got elephants wading across it just makes it that much more special. But you can see they take it quite easy and that's because of how many rocks there are in this particular water section. They have to 
take it and just slowly push and put their feet down and try and figure out their way across so that they don't fall. And most of the time, they'll also guide the little ones across. Suzanne, you're asking how elephants communicate. Well, they've got a number of ways that they communicate. They use body language, which would be in the form of stiff tails, ears out, raised trunks, or something like that. Then they'll also use communication in terms of sound. So sound would be low rumbles. Um, they have a, a ability to produce sound much in a much lower frequency than what our ears can hear and they'll pick those up and that will be able to kind of talk to each other and figure out where they're going what they're going to be doing and then they'll also use chemical signatures so when they defecate if they walk past where they've defecated then they'll try and kind of smell that dung and that will tell them if it's another herd or if it's members of their herd or what the situation is with them so they have three sort of ways that they're communicating but this the way of producing sound is the most effective and the one that they use the most how cool is that just watching them wade across the river absolutely amazing and they stop every now and then to have a little bit of a drink particularly when they get to the edges of the river so when they get to the other side you'll find that they'll have a bit of a drink and even there is where the babies will often start to roll around and have a little bit of a swim to start cooling off it is getting quite warm already this morning we're finding the temperatures are starting to rise quite quickly and so it's the perfect opportunity just to cool down a little bit at the water's edge absolutely magnificent now you see there's one that's broken off on the left hand side of the sort of train and they often are the ones that will start to swim a little bit you can see how it kind of spreads out once they've gotten across the sort of dangerous part of the river then they start to break apart a little bit and will start to go into the bank area and start to feed off the acacias and the grasses that are on the banks absolutely spectacular now, a herd of ellies like this won't be too concerned with crocodiles. There's enough big adults there that would potentially be able to protect any little ones or react to any crocodile action. And plus, the crocodiles in this section, they're not really interested in going after elephants. It's ultimately way too big a meal. It's much easier to be hunting the wildebeest and zebra that are crossing at this time of the year. Right, well, we're going to continue with on and see if we can find where those wildebeest are. They should be very, very close by. They and we should be able to figure out where they are and hopefully they'll cross for us. Right, and so while we do that, let's send you back to the Masai Mara with Steve, who's looking at a beautiful feathered friend. Indeed, Tristan, miles and miles further upstream from you. If you are only just joining us now, welcome to the CGTN Wild Wonderland live show. We are on the banks of the Mara River where we have a pied kingfisher, a male in fact. And not all birds, or not, should I say, not all animals come down to the water just to drink. Some animals actually live next to the water and they feed this kingfisher being one of the few birds that we find along the river here that actually has the ability to fish. So they will actually perch themselves and this bird itself actually has the ability to hover. The largest bird that we have in Africa that can physically hover and they can go quite far out into streams and dams and lakes and hover and then fly down into the water catching fish with that very, very sharp looking beak which has got some very specialized ridges inside. If you've ever tried to hold a fish with your bare hands, be very, very hard for you to do so. And they're able to um, hold on to fish in that beak and even turn it around a few times and then swallow it whole. This bird perched very nicely on a branch, watching the world go by. Take care, you wanna know where the source of the Mara River is? Well, the catchment um, is many, many, many miles north of where we are right now. Um, it ends in Lake Victoria, much further to the south, and it's approximately, approximately 400 kilometers long. So it's a very, very long river, and it is a permanent river flowing all year round. Obviously, the level fluctuates depending on the rainfall, but rain can fall very, very far away and can change what's going on much further downstream. But the life source indeed of the Mara system. And while well, David down further from where we are right now is sitting with some very sleepy cats.
Well, staying by the river, Steve, you see so many things, including the kingfishers and, you know, talking of how kingfishers feed on fish. I remember it's only once I've ever seen a lioness eating fish in water. I'm not sure it was very hungry, but it's always not their first choice. Now, I earlier said the hyena I saw eating could have, you know, been enjoying the benefit of some killers. And I think these were the lions that must have brought that will be down. Now, this particular pride here is called the sausage tree pride. And it's one of the largest prides that we have here in the Masimara. And the pride consists of five females and 10 cubs. When the wildebeest hadn't come, when the migration was not here, this particular pride kept bringing down buffaloes. Of all the prides I know in the Masimara, this one, I respect it because they are very good in bringing down buffaloes. And you see all the flies on top of their bodies like that because they've been eating and I'm sure they're the ones who killed uh, the wildebeest we saw the hyena feeding earlier. And you can see the panting going on because they have so much protein. They have so much meat in their bodies and because it's getting warm, that's exactly what happens. They'll just keep panting. The breeze continues though. And they have taken a very good uh, location under a fig tree to get some nice shade. Well, it's very normal for, you know, cats to snooze, cheetahs, lions, and I think Jamie's leopard could be having a snooze also. I mean, it's very, very normal for big cats to snooze during the day. It's less normal for adult male leopards to snooze when people are standing a couple of meters away from them. I've been doing this for many years, and I have never, ever known a leopard like Osana. To be able to do this is a dream come true, and at the moment, because there's nobody else interested in coming to see him, it's well, not interested, but nobody else is on their way to come and see him yet, it feels as though it's just us and Hosanna in this great, vast wilderness. It's the most peaceful setting ever. I mean, his nose is itchy. He hasn't even lifted his head, and we've crept a little bit closer because we needed to get a different view when he moved into the shade to be able to see him. And this is, this is a wild cat. He weighs probably over 70 kilograms of pure power and muscle with lightning fast reflexes. And we're watching him sleep on his side like he could not be happier in the world that we're here with him. I don't think it's particularly that he seeks out human company or that he likes having human company, but he definitely doesn't mind it. We've in no way changed what he was going to do this morning. He was going to have a snooze in the shade, and he was going to do that regardless of whether or not we were here. All right, so while Hosanna has what I assume is a well-deserved nap, there's no sleep for those following the migration, certainly not for James. I'm not sure that Hosanna deserves a nap. All of these cats seem to be sleeping their way through their lives uh, while they should be doing other interesting things, I feel. We're sitting here with a small herd of wildebeest on a piece of ground that was a few days ago absolutely covered. And I just want to show you something here that I have picked up off the plains. And that is one of the most important parts of East Africa's ecology. And you won't believe what it is when I show it to you. It is this. It is dung. And without this dung, produced by the millions of herbivores that come moving through this area, there wouldn't be anything like the same fertility that there is. So these animals take a lot of grass, but they put a huge amount back in. And I think that you'll find that the herds come onto an area like this, and they graze it flat, and they move off it mostly because the grass becomes unpalatable because of all the waste product that eventually ends up on the ground. 
And I think that the great mystery of why they crossed the river has something to do with this. I think it has something to do with the fact that the grass on either side of the rivers becomes completely unpalatable after they've been standing on it for a couple of days. I mean, you can imagine a million wildebeest, well, a million wildebeest moving through an area, and you can imagine what the grass must taste like after that. Kerpel, you say, ew? Well, it's not very disgusting, it's just grass and it actually has a very pleasant smell once it's got a, a couple of days in the sun. It smells like hay. You all know what dry hay smells like? Well that's what this smells like. Hay with a bit of goat mixed in. Actually very ungoaty. I'm smelling it now. It's a very pleasant smell. The best smelling dung out here is elephant dung, aged for a few days. But this has a very nice fragrance kind of herby kind of smell, which is good. Uh, something that I bet produces a smell that is pretty disgusting is a lizard, especially a monitor lizard. Well, I think monitor lizards, yes, but these little agamas, I don't think, will produce that bad a smell. But he is the most colourful of the lizards that we get out here, and he's doing his little morning exercise push-ups, as they generally do. And that's all displaying to a female that is nearby. You can see her just on the bottom right of that hippo skull. And it's really nice because generally it's quite tricky to explain sort of ratios of size on these lizards. But now with the hippo skull, you can get a bit of a better idea of how big these agamas are. The female is just ducked behind the skull itself and the male is still sitting out in front. Now they are come out at this time of the day. I was saying just now with the ellies that it's starting to warm up and these lizards would have been very cold during the course of the night, especially in these rocky areas. And so they're going to be very happy to be out in the sunshine now, being able to warm up and that will allow them to get active. As you can see, they're running around all over the chase, I mean place, chasing one another in order to probably one, either mate or two, to find food. And they will have probably spent the night in these little rocky outcrops or even underneath that hippo skull and they would have then you know from there come out and emerge during the course of the day but it's a nice also look at a hippo skull and the dentition of hippos this particular skull has probably been placed here by the rangers in this area it's a, right on the junction of a road and um, these teeth can show you just how dangerous hippos can be. You see those bottom lower canines that are incredibly sharp. Now, Nancy, you say what a weird color our lizard is. It is a weird color. It reminds us all of Spider-Man. So we all kind of, as, as guides within um, Wild Wonderland, we all think that they look just like a Spider-Man lizard. And so they've got these beautiful colors and they add a bit of spice and kind of flavor, I think, to the area. I quite like seeing them, especially on the rocky areas. You know, most things on rocks are trying to camouflage and trying to really kind of look the same as the rock itself, whereas these guys are trying to stand out as much as possible in order to be able to essentially attract attention from the females but it looks like they've decided to disappear and that they're not going to show themselves maybe they wanted a private moment behind the hippo skull and so while we carry on and see if we can find the wildebeest let's send you back across to steve who's got some ellies of his own <laughs> private moment behind the hippo skull sounds very interesting well here we are back in the mara triangle with the elephants that have been emerging out of the forest and the forest runs along the banks of the mara river you can see these ellies are nice and damp they've been for a swim and something that is also quite noticeable of the elephants in the mara is how white and clean their tusks are because they don't use them as much for feeding on trees like they do down in South Africa. They're very stained and dirty down south. And my name is Steve Folgenbridge, joined by jean -Dre on camera. And we are having a wonderful afternoon out here this morning. Our elephants slowly emerging out of the forest. Now, they're feeding on grass now for the most part. Uh, but every now and again, I'm sure they will be eating the odd tree, odd bit of bark. Look how giant those trees are. Cranky Pangolin, you want to know how elephant herds, different herds would interact with each other? Well, elephants, when they meet each other, different herds sometimes are actually related. So when a herd gets to a certain size, you'll often find two of the oldest females splitting off 
right and left uh, with their whole family unit and then moving off for months, even years sometimes. And when they come back together and greet each other, it is the most remarkable thing to see. It reminds me somewhat of spending time at the airport at the international arrival section when you see people coming out of the sort of terminal gates and meeting their relatives. There's love, there's hugs, there's tears, there's compassion, there's all sorts of things going on. Elephants are like that. They see each other and they run up to each other and they sniff and they touch and they caress. And it really is quite something to behold. Um, you don't ever see any animosity really between different herds. The only time you ever see animosity or negative behavior is when you've got big bull elephants sort of trying to get in the mix. Oh, that one's having a bit of a bum scratch against the tree, Jandre trying to get in the mix and trying to mate or sniff out potential mates within the herd. That is when you get all sorts of weird behavior in elephant herds. But generally, when herds meet, they know each other from somewhere in the distant past. And they've got very, very good memories. And it is very, very special to see. We see it a lot in South Africa when the herds sort of move their migration routes or they spend different time in different areas due to youngsters, uh, due to all sorts of factors really. And when they get back together again, it is really quite emotional and probably one of my favorite things to witness in the African wilderness. Elephants re-socializing and reaffirming their bonds. Well, it's not only elephants who reaffirm their bonds. Sometimes when you see lions seeing each other after some time, it can also be quite magical. Well, from elephants, one of the big five to another one, you know, another of the big five. And I still got my pride. What I did, I tried to reposition myself and try to come a little closer to this lionesses and you can see how flat they are but you could one to the left of the other just yawning and maybe wondering about the next meal but as it gets hot like this definitely nothing doing so what she might most likely do is to look for another place to bed much cooler more shade let's see where she goes she's going to the very base of that tree see her belly how full she is you might mistake her to be pregnant, but she is not pregnant. She's just very full. And I see them spending the rest of the day here because of the heat of the day. It's very normal for the lions. We've got one that's close to us because I know all the five girls by name. And what I'll do, I'll show you one of those females. Remember, you're watching CGTN Wild Wonderland live show and we're coming to you from the Masai Mara. We all know the names of these particular lions and I'm gonna show you one that I really love to watch. And my name hasn't changed, it's David and manning the camera is Bungay. Remember, should you have any questions, please send them through hashtag CGTNWild or hashtag Wild Wonderland. Now, the one particular female I want to show you is the one that's close. You see one legs up and the one close to us, it's called Limpy. Limpy initially had two cubs, but currently she got one cub. I talked about 10 cubs in this particular pride, but currently she got one cub. One cub we think she could have lost either to other predators or it could have been diseases or anything would have happened to her. Let's learn more about Limpy. Lions can be difficult to distinguish from each other. So when one of the sausage tree pride lionesses appeared with facial lacerations and a pronounced limp, she unsurprisingly received the nickname Limpy. Limpy's face healed with time and there was further joy in store with the birth of two sons in October 2018. Unfortunately, as happens frequently in nature, the joy was tempered with tragedy. So often we find bereft mothers searching the haunts where their little ones used to hide.
Limpy's calls appeared to come from a place of profound grief. We don't know what fate befell the missing brother. But the other cub was luckier. Limpy remained concerned and protective for her remaining son, even forbidding playtime with father. Thus far, Limpy and the sausage tree lionesses have managed to keep this little fellow safe. Nature is always a juxtaposition of emotions, happiness and sadness quite often because of so much happens out here. There's a lot of death, there's a lot of new life and there's no interference in an area like this, which is great. It makes us uh, kind of, I guess it connects us more deeply with things that are natural. My name is James Hendry. James is on camera with his enormous finger and we're looking over there at a massive elephant bull. He's probably about a six ton animal. And I always like to think of elephants as ships floating through the grass sea. Enormous big ships. They just look so gently moving despite their huge size. It changes when they start running, of course, then they start to look rather ridiculous. But when they're just moving like that, it's the most peaceful thing to watch, especially with the backdrop of that little inselberg and the enormous vault of the African sky. And you can hear that there's just a very little sound at the moment because the heat of the day is starting. The only thing you can hear, maybe very faintly, is a rufous-naped lark. And Otherwise, all is at peace. And soon, what you'll be able to hear is the flies, because the flies really enjoy the hot part of the day. Now, I can't believe this, but Jamie has been sitting with a leopard on foot all morning. What an absolute privilege for her and for all of us to share it with her. It is a privilege. It really is. It is a profound privilege. And you know that I reckon I could even get a little bit closer. Oh, flies bothering you. Look at this. Look how cute see he's being. I reckon we could probably get even closer, but that is where I draw the line. I don't believe that he would do anything to us, and I don't believe that he'd even run away. But there is a boundary that we need to establish at this point as he comes into his own and into adulthood. And I just don't think pushing it any further is a good idea. Things can change so quickly, and leopard's reflexes are so phenomenally fast that it would put both him and us at risk. So we're going to settle for the view which we have, which I have to say we're not going to complain about. Uh, we're probably, I would say, 20 meters from him. It will take 15. We're 15 meters according to the camera specs. So look at what it's telling us. 15 meters away from a wild leopard. He lives wild. He doesn't get fed. This is his home and he's let us into his world. And I'm so relaxed with him that I've actually been crouched down looking through the grass and sort of thinking about what it must be like being a little antelope or a scrub hare moving through this vegetation and encountering a leopard laid out like this. Because I can imagine if something were to come from behind him, he'd be almost invisible. Which is, of course, the whole nature of leopards, is to be secretive. If elephants are like ships sailing through the grass, then leopards, I guess, would be something similar to submarines. Hidden away and launching only when necessary. Oh, I don't know what to say, except that when big cats sleep, they sleep like champions, whether it's here in the Greater Kruger or across in the Masai Mara.
Well, it is very true when it comes to sleep. Could be sleep and lions, as much as are exiting cats, when they choose to sleep, they can also sleep. And there have been always been a misconception where people have thought it's only the male lions that sleep. It's true. Male lions do sleep sometimes 14, 15, 16 hours in a day. They sleep for a long time. But also the females having the right conditions. I'm talking of having enough to eat, enough to drink. They got good shade. They are safe where they are. They can sleep as much. Earlier, I spoke of one female that we call Limpy, and I'm sure you know why we call her Limpy, because she's still limping even today. Now, the one I'm showing you on the screen now, or the one Bungay rather, who is doing all the magical work here to bring you these beautiful images, that particular one is called Kink Tail. Now, I want you to look at her tail very carefully, and you'll notice it's got a knot. Did you see that? Uh, well done, Bungay. Now, she might have picked you know uh, that particular knot way back either from a bite or from an infection we do not know but she has been having it since she was young and we call her kink tail because of that particular bent uh, on her tail she's apparently the pathfinder or the matriarch if i may call it of this particular pride and you can see all the flies on her mouth and her whiskers and if you look on her ears, you see they are quite torn. And this is an indication of being old. And she is the oldest female in this particular pride. Apparently she got some ticks there, if you look. And the flies are quite irritating. And she has to keep flicking her ears every now and then. See how they have covered all the body? They don't give them any infection, apparently, but they're just annoying. And by her just rolling over, it's just trying to reduce the amount of flies on that particular side of the body. We've got some cubs having a bit of movement there. And there's one that's coming on top of the belly of Kinky. Kinky got three cubs, and I think one just got hungry, and she's suckling. How cool is this? Isn't this wonderful? Take care. That's a very good question. And you're wondering where Limpy got her limp from. Take care. During last year's migration, I'm talking about 2018, hunting, running, and sprinting out here in the field. It's very crucial for lions. And it's during that hunt, or it's during migration of 2018, on one of the runs or on one of her hands, she sprained her foot and that's where she got the limb from. It has never, I would say, recovered 100%. There are times when you see her, unless you know her, you'll not notice the limb. But for us who have been living with these lions or following them for a long time, we can easily pick it up. Certain times, should she also not do it right, you get the limb looking very bad. So that's how she picked uh, her limb take care from last year during uh, the migration of 2018. Now, talking of migration of 2018, now we have the migration of 2019 with Tristan. We do indeed. We've got a nice big herd that is starting to develop on the river itself. We're quite far from the river at the moment, and the reason for that is if you drive right up to the river bank with these wildebeest, you'll find that they're going to end up getting spooked and they'll actually move away from the water's edge. Right now, they're right on the edge of the water, so we give them a lot of room, and when they start crossing, then you can drive down to them. But you can see it's a mass of wildebeest that are piling along the bank of the river. They still look as though they're searching for a decent crossing point and are moving quite quickly. There's quite a lot of them that are coming in this direction, so I'm hoping that we'll get a crossing at some point during the course of this morning. But for those of you that have just joined us this morning, my name is Tristan, um, and it is very, very nice to have you in the Serengeti side of things, and hopefully we are going to be able to get these wildebeest crossing at some point. We're in a great sort of spot because where they're going to go is a nice sort of shallow area for these guys to be able to get over. And it's, are there any crocodiles around? Yes, there are crocodiles around, but in saying that the 
wildebeest at the moment actually have it fairly easy here in terms of crossings um, from a crocodile perspective and the reason why is that there's been a number of crossings already heading into Kenya. All those wildebeest that you're seeing with James and Steve and David, they have all come from the side and that means that the crocs have already feasted heavily and so we've seen a number of crossings in the last few weeks where the crocodiles don't even get into the water. They just sit on the banks watching the wildebeest cross and they have had more than enough food already. So you're not seeing too many attacks of the crocodiles at the moment but that's not to say that there isn't a hungry crocodile still left in the river there hasn't actually been too many crossings where we are right now and so maybe some of the crocs that call this stretch of the river home might still be quite hungry and therefore might go after these guys but there is certainly a lot of crocodiles around it's just going to be depending on where they cross as to whether those crocodiles have had a feast yet during this year's migration or if they are still waiting for the migration herds to come over at the crossing point where they inhabit it's a long, long stretch that the wildebeest cross here in the Serengeti. It covers a very long distance um, and there is 12 crossing points in total. And so, you know, they've only been crossing probably in about four of those 12 in the last few weeks. And so a number of them still have, I would imagine, quite hungry crocodiles that are lying in wait. But isn't it amazing to watch them walk along? They look just like ants when you see them from far away. It's just these kind of movement of these shimmering bodies through the vegetation. It's an incredible sight to see as they build up. And what you need is essentially a whole group of them to get to a point where they feel like they want to cross. And the pressure of all the herd moving behind them and building and building and building eventually drives them to cross over northwards towards the Masai Mara. So hopefully it will take place at some point. It's heating up a little bit. And so often when it starts to get quite warm, they start to actually get a little bit more kind of pressured into going towards the water and the crossings then start to take place so it's looking good and there's at least a nice decent sized herd that has built up on the banks of the Mara River still on the southern side but hopefully they'll come north at some point soon right we're going to be patient and we'll stick with them as they meander their way along the river in the meantime though let's send you across to David who has a sausage tree pride that is not doing any meandering at the moment Well, you never know what happens with such a huge, you know, herd of wildebeest, either a lion or leopard or other type of predator just appear from nowhere. And being so close to the river is always exciting. Well, I have not left my lions because this one particular cub seems to be very hungry. And maybe the cub knows the mother had a kill and that particular mother she's suckling from is kingtail. Big sneeze from one of the lioness, actually limpy. She just sneezed and woke up and went to a different place. Just tell where you are, Kinky. If she raises up, you can see her tail. Shem, you see, there's so many flies, and I'll tell you some of the natural networks of the wildebeest when they come are flies. This is not as bad. You'll see in the afternoon there'll be so many flies. Yesterday in the afternoon, I had to get some kind of bush whisk, something similar to a fly whisk to fight the flies. But now the ones you see on the lions is just because these lions this morning had a bountiful breakfast of two wildebeest that they brought down. In this particular pride, as I said before, there are 10 cubs. Two of them are just about a year and they're all cubs. And I'm looking at them at one day forming their own coalition. In August 2018, two little male cubs were born to the sausages. The pride provided ample protection for the little fellows as they grew out of their most vulnerable stage. As the new year dawned, the little chaps began to travel to the pride's feasts. They remained wary, as well they should have at that age. Cute they might be, but a meat lion is a hungry one, and these two already display ferocious aggression at kills, even with the saber-toothed lionesses. You 
are back with us in the Mara. And if you are just joining us, you are watching the CG CGTN Wild Wonderland live show. Where we have got a Defasa waterbuck. Big horns declare him to be a male. Females are without horns. Males use them for fighting. For the right to mate. Not like the buffalo that use them for fighting as well as defending themselves against lions. Waterbuck generally run when they see lions. And as the name implies, waterbuck are never more than about three quarters of a mile from water. Very, very water dependent. Probably about a third the weight of a buffalo, but yet requiring twice the amount of water per day which I find quite incredible. A lot of that's probably got to do with that very shaggy coat that he's got there. That must be incredibly warm in the heat of the day. His nose is working overtime, trying to figure out what we are. And there he goes, trotting off into the distance. Well, from this beautiful water buck in the long grass, let me send you down to the Sabi Sands in South Africa with my friend Jamie. Oh, we've gone from a beautiful water bucket to a, a pile of dung, but it's all part and parcel of what it is we do out here. So I've decided we had spent enough time with Hosanna and I left him to his morning nap and we've gone off in search of other things. And searching for things on foot means looking at more than just tracks on the ground. Sometimes signs come in all shapes and sizes. In this case, it's quite a large size because this pile of dung was deposited by one elephant. Now look at the size of it. I mean, in comparison to me, this is just one piece over here. And just a quick reintroduction while holding a piece of poo. My name is Jamie and behind the camera is Craig and you're watching CGTN's Wild Wonderland. And it is quite damp still and I can tell you that it is roughly 16 hours old. How do I know that? Well, I'm cheating. I saw this elephant yesterday afternoon when I was driving past this spot. But it is still wet because it's winter, which means that it is still, it's not dried out. The temperatures are not all that high. Now I'm breaking it open, you'll notice with my hands, you might think that that's quite disgusting. However, this animal only eats uh, plant material. So there's no kind of bacteria or anything like that that is in any way a threat to me. I will still wash my hands afterwards. But examining the dung of animals is actually quite an important part of how we understand their behavior. And at the moment, Steve's been telling you all about how elephants in the Kruger shift their diet. Well, this is what they shift their diet to. And their digestive systems end up leaving quite a large portion of what they eat undigested. So they will defecate out between a third and half of what they ingest. For a big bull elephant, that means that it can defecate 150 kilograms of dung in one day. Just process that for one second. And while you process that, while one elephant may deposit large amounts of dung, uh, over a million wildebeest will deposit somewhat more. They also deposit large amounts of dung, and I must say, I thought until today that elephant dung was even more nice smelling than wildebeest dung. I'm afraid I think I've changed my mind. That wildebeest dung I uh, inhaled a little earlier smelt of all the herbs of the Maasai Mara. It was delicious. Now, we've come into the area where this cheetah is. She's in this grass somewhere. The herds have closed in around her, but we cannot see the cheetah. And that's because she's in this very long grass. And I'm sure she's watching to see if she can't pick out a youngster who she might be able to snaffle for breakfast. Somewhere in this grass, there are a whole lot of people here with us and none of them can see the cheetah. She's disappeared into this long grass. All righty, we're gonna wait here. We're not gonna go anywhere. Let's go back to Steve, who's got a very exciting situation. Thanks, James. Well, we've managed to catch up with some herds of our own. 
breeding herd of elephants. And this female right here in front of us is feeding. She's very close to the car. And she's also got a quite a round belly. Now, because she doesn't have a calf right close nearby, I'm going to assume that she's very far into pregnancy. And they've got a gestation period of 22 months. Here comes the rest of the herd behind. The female essentially's always got a calf nearby unless she's pregnant. Isn't she gorgeous? There we go. There's a couple little youngsters keeping their ears a little bit flatter to the head. It's their cooling system. The air conditioner. They're all walking directly towards us. This is so special. Rainbow D, you want to know how old an elephant is when it starts feeding on grass? Well, you see that one there, it's throwing its trunk around. It's trying to figure out how to use the trunk. Uh, so for the first two years, they are pretty much suckling from mum. They don't need the trunk for that. They lift the trunk and they just use their mouth. But for those two years, they move around and they try and pick up things that mum drops. They try and utilize that trunk which has got 100,000 muscles in it. And eventually after about two years, two and a half years, they're able to start feeding on grass. But it takes them that enormous amount of time to figure out how to use that trunk. And they are right here, right next to us. This is so incredible. Look at the tusks on that one, Jandre. The tusks on this girl. Incredible tusks. Now, generally, the biggest elephant in the herd, if it's a female, is the matriarch. The queen, she leads the herd. And then everyone else is most likely related in some way. Mum's not only always teaching them, she also provides a very good amount of shade when the sun is hot. And you can see that one is right there where her trunk is. She's busy sniffing exactly what mum is doing and tries to use the trunk to grab it. See that twisting motion? Every now and again they get a little bit like a human child with that spoon towards their mouth. It takes them a while. They mess most of it on the face and on the bib. Eventually they start getting that coordination. It's the same with elephants. Oh, there we go, look at that. So that one is probably about two and a half at the moment. And it's able to access a fair bit of grass now, but probably still getting a little bit of milk from mum. They will try as long as they can if mum allows them to. Quite often mum will stop them from feeding on their milk at a certain time because Although they still want milk, mum is probably with a child inside and so is lactating once again. So the milk is available. Sometimes younger mothers can suckle a lot longer than they need to. Okay, well, we're going to maybe follow this herd for a little bit more. Maybe we can get some good shots. And in the meantime, let's send you back to Tristan in the Serengeti. Indeed, we are in the Serengeti, and as you can see, we're still watching these wildies piling past. They're still building up on the riverbank, so I'm pretty sure we will have a crossing at some point. But when you're in amongst the herds of wildebeest, particularly down here in the Serengeti, not so much in the Mara, these wooded areas have a nasty creature that can make life a little bit unpleasant. So I'm going to show you what it looks like a nice and close. So basically what we've got here is a titsy fly. Now this is one that we just found that unfortunately was already dead in the vehicle. They land in the vehicle and then they die unfortunately overnight sometimes. But you'll see that it's got a massive proboscis that comes out of its face. Now that proboscis is what it will actually sting you with. 
and it will drink your blood. And these guys can actually be quite dangerous. They can give you sleeping sickness, and they're something that you want to try and avoid as much as possible. They're not a very pleasant thing at all, and when they get you, it really, really hurts. So even though it's nice to be around the migration, something like this is not something you want to have landing on you, and they constantly are around. Now, the problem with them is that they're attracted to blue and black, which means that at the moment we are a walking tetsy attraction and so they come and land on you and then they stick this in and they'll be able to drink your blood from there now you can tell male and female apart just by their coloration the male is a blue black color and the female is a sort of grayish coloration now this one because it's dead has lost its color but it looks like it was a male um, it's gone a bit more sort of a gray color now but they have a sort of blue black color when they are alive but amazing little creatures and incredibly resilient they are able to withstand um, all kinds of things from temperature to even um, you know things like force and, and stuff like that and you see the poor wildebeest constantly trying to swat these things away and they just come back for more all the time Jonathan you're saying what could have killed it Jonathan don't know really I mean like I said it was found in the car um, so maybe it had already gone past its life cycle um, and already um, you know done its fulfilled its role in that it had fed and then bred um, and then died from there so they do obviously not live forever um, so I'm pretty sure that's what happened to it you often in the mornings find them um, dead like that right so I'm being attacked by another tetsi while I'm holding this one so I'm going to try and get that one away from me in the meantime though <laughs> let's send you to a predator up in the Mara that hopefully will not be biting David this morning well, yeah, Tristan, you have to be very careful of those uh, sassaflies because I think the sassaflies got teeth that are much bigger, much sharper than the mosquitoes, and the proboscis are always very strong. I remember the very first time I went to the western corridors of Serengeti, I had a sassafly bite that almost made me tip uh, the cow over. I mean, they're very powerful and once they bite you for example here the very first advice i was given by one of the locals if it's biting you here just leave it alone just like a vampire let it suck as much blood as it can and once it sucks blood it's just going to blow up i don't know how true that is what could be and luckily we don't have the sister flies here we've got different flies that we may call the lion flies that are still on this particular pride that we call the sausage tree pride we give our prides or characters' names for different particular reasons. This particular pride are very fond of climbing trees. There are many different species of trees in Africa. And here in Kenya, there's one particular type that we call the sausage tree. And the flies that are bothering them, if they become so much and they become such a nuisance on the ground, what they'll do, they'll climb trees. And the sausage tree is one favorite for them. Of course, staying up that tree, it also gives them some wonderful shade. And also, if you look carefully where they are, the grass is quite different than the red oat grass that is surrounding them. This is much greener and definitely much softer, and it makes it easier for them to bend. Bunge, if you come to me, I want to show you, I'll show the viewers some different sort of grass here. This particular grass that we call red oat grass, where I come from in my village, we make you be easy to make thatches, to make roofs. Can you see Bungay? Is that good for you? Happy there? We use that grass to make roofs where I come from. And it comes very handy. It's quite tall grass and it goes to about a meter. And currently, most of the areas here where I am, we got about two meters long of grass which the lions are taking advantage to hide before they go for their prey. Well, I'll give you another quick look of these lions before we go to my friend Steve, whose elephants are still around. This female is pretty cool. Thanks, Gigi. Oh, we're staying with our herd here, and they're eating all sorts of grass here at the moment. Right here next to the river, it's difficult to say what grass is growing here. A lot of it, I think, is couch grass, uh, which is a natural sort of grass that grows close to water. Um, it grows as like a carpet along the grass, along the ground, and is used for stabilizing the ground. It's a very, very good ecological grass for stabilizing banks 
uh, where you get lots of herbivore pressure. Hippos actually mow this down into a very nice sort of lawn and elephants thoroughly enjoy it as you can see. This whole herd here has managed to get their faces and trunks right in it. It's nice and dense green vegetation and they are making the most Okay, well it all starts off with grass, goes in the mouth, chewed down and then eventually comes out the digestive system in the form of some form of dung. And something very similar happened with hyena as it walked along this path. So we're continuing our scatological conversation and we're talking at this point about hyena scat. Now, I said that there's a reason that we have such a fascination with the end product of animals' digestive processes. And I said that it tells us quite a lot about the animal concerned. And this is another prime example of exactly what I was talking about. You'll notice I am using a stick to prod it. I am not using my hands this time around. This is because this particular pile of excrement came from a predator, which means that it is a host to all sorts of parasites, and I definitely don't want to touch it with my bare hands. The first thing you'll notice is that it is white in color, and that's important because it tells us just how efficient hyena are at digesting bones. Now, lion and leopard, occasionally their scat will turn white if they've eaten quite a few bones. Sometimes Sometimes the soft edges of the end of the cartilage parts of their prey but hyenas hyenas can actually break it down the bone and they have the stomach acid that is basically able to break down almost anything so the calcium from the bones of whatever this hyena ate is what has turned it white in color you'll also find with hyena scat there's very little hair very little solid that is left behind and that tells us just how efficient hyenas are when it comes to scavenging and how they leave nothing to go to waste because lions can't really break open the big bones. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm completely thrown because Shay says that they look like marshmallows. As it happens, I don't like marshmallows, so I'm okay with this. But for those of, for those of you for whom that, uh, you know, this is... Uh, um, perhaps you did like marshmallows. I'm truly sorry. Uh, I hope that it doesn't ruin the future of your marshmallow enjoyment. On that really, truly entertaining note, I think we'll send you back across to the Maasai Mara, where James is enjoying the benefits of the migration. Marshmallows are ruined for everybody all the time. I think I think they're disgusting things, and I think hyena dung is equally disgusting. I also wanted to comment on those tsetse flies that Tristan had. They, of course, have played a major, major role in the design of this environment. For without them, there would have been people and cattle in this area, and it was the tsetse fly that eventually drove them away, which I think is fascinating. There don't not so many up here because there are far fewer trees up in the Masamara than there are down in the Serengeti, but the tsetse fly is still a very important ecological architect if you like it's quite amazing to describe a fly as an ecological architect as disgusting and painful as they are they really are very beastly things right our cheetah is supposed to be just in front of us in the grass the wildebeest are slowly closing in closer, more just about we think about to stand on the cheetah so the cheetah is just in front of us here Just over there, we think. But we can't see her, so she'll be waiting for an injured young one possibly to come through here. Cranky Pangolin, you're wondering about whether predators killed the most of the migration. I think that was your question, something like that. Uh, no, most of the animals that uh, die during the migration die of causes extra to predators. So they die of old age or of sickness or injury and that sort of thing. And the scavengers will make use of their carcasses. Now, we are unfortunately about to end this show. 
we're going to stay here with this cheetah. So watch out for CGTN's social media platforms over the course of the day. And if any of the action kicks off here, we will be sure to go live with it. Otherwise, we will see the rest of you at 4 o'clock Central African time. You can work out what time that is wherever you happen to be in the world. Thank you very much for your questions and your comments. It's been a great joy, as always, to bring you the great migration from three locations in Africa.